Aloha. It's June the 17th. It's Wednesday. It's 11 o'clock. That could be only one thing. It's Trump week. I'm Tim Apicelli, your host, and I'd like to introduce our guests for this day and for this Trump week. Uh, Winston Welch, welcome. Stephanie Dalton, welcome. And Cynthia Sinclair, welcome, welcome, welcome. Hey, you guys, um, I've kind of thrown in something on the agenda here called jaw-dropping moments of the week. I, I kind of threw it on you guys last week, and you know, Donald Trump never disappoints. So um, this week we had more jaw-dropping moments as well. And I'd just like to just go out there right to you, Winston, with the first one, and that is for the second or third time now, Donald Trump has said uh, regarding uh, the coronavirus 19 um, rates of infection and the death toll, and, and he says the following. If we stop testing right now, we'd have very few cases, if any. So as Donald Trump's uh, Tulsa political rally is about ready to happen on Saturday, Donald Trump feels very confident and comfortable to say that just stop testing and all the cases will go away. Um, that's a jaw dropping moment for me. And I'm uh, just kind of curious what you think. You know, everything that's popping out of his mouth these days. I, there's been a shift in the last couple of weeks. I, I'm feeling something different. Like, like the masses have woken up a lot of the people that have said, you know what, this is just too much. And that's, that's like saying, um, if we, if we um, go hide in the basement without any windows, the sun doesn't come up tomorrow. <laughs> that's a good point. <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> How are you? what it says and you just strip it and you don't say i support this man i don't support this man whatever and you just look at it for what it is um yeah are we becoming so um desensitized to these outrageous statements from donald trump that we just kind of go uh it's donald trump what are you gonna do what are you gonna say i mean yeah, any so other time any other president any other human being would say are you kidding me his supporters will either say it's true we're we're we're, uh, we're too aggressively testing or we should these are it's it's over overblown or it's made up or whatever or they just ignore it that's the way easier thing to do and just say you know what he's doing the greater good for our nation so we got to ignore this stuff uh, wow. and just don't even talk about it what a place we've come to um stephanie welcome uh, your thoughts about his statement and the tulsa uh rally that's going to take place on saturday and certainly no mandate or requirement to wear a mask. And we're looking at thousands and thousands of people in, in, indoors and um, the rate of infection will take place. Um, your thoughts about his statement about, well, if you stop testing, we don't have cases. And then his, I, I just think it's bold arrogance to say, I'm gonna put as many people in there as possible, have them sign a waiver that if they get sick and die, it's not my fault and uh, carry on with what, that, which I wanna carry on with. And that's my rally. I, I'm, I don't understand how many red flags are needed to help these people who orient to the red, white, and blue flag so strongly don't see the red flags and to their own personal hazard. So, I mean, my heart goes out to them for the, the condition they're in of complete obeisance to him. Um, or dedication or devotion, whatever it is, my heart really goes out to them because many of them are going to get very sick and who wants this thing? It's very difficult, much worse than the regular flu and, or the irregular flu. And, and many, and some will die because the oldsters got me, you know, whoever his um, at-risk, highest at-risk group supporters are, I'm sure they're uh, enough well, of that. Yeah, many can die and they won't even be present at that uh, so, rally because... You yeah, know, there's the infection rate to family members and friends and yeah. strangers. Well, I'm thinking that there must be um, we we could we could get glass half full by looking for the statements that he makes that are substantive, are whatever data based or or could contain policy hints. <laughs> or yeah. we could look for those be. Because are they there, or are we just totally overwhelmed by just one jaw dropper after thoughtless, thoughtless, unthinking? Um, you know. Alrighty, let me let me ask Cynthia. Uh, actually, I already know that you already figured this one out before we started the show because you said 
wow, did you hear that statement from Donald Trump? So before the show started, your jaw had already dropped. Cynthia, your thoughts? Well, when he said it, I literally came up out of my chair oh. and went, how can you be this stupid screaming at the television? Um, but you know, it's not so much stupid, it's stupidity. It's, it's a planned, you know, you've got to get those, um, those dog whistles and all of that propaganda out there to your supporters. And that's how he does it. You know, he makes them believe that that's the way to fix this virus. And because they believe in him, they, they think that's real. And that's the scariest part is that the effect that that, that that comment has, it doesn't just show how stupid he is, um, but it, it shows how dangerous he is because he's putting that out to his base and all those people will believe him. Well, General Mattis basically implied or not implied, explicitly stated, this is no different than some of the things that took place in the Nazi regime as far as his, you know, his um, dividing the country. Exactly. And, and the things that he says to do by the, the country. And General Mattis is not what I call an alarmist. He, uh, he is a very solid general that is well respected. And he basically saying Donald Trump is taking pages out of the Nazi regime to do these things. Absolutely. You look at the dictator's playbook. Page one, divide the people. Um, number two, vilify the press. Number three, launch a massive uh, propaganda machine. And then you have to make people not trust their own selves. They, you know, they, he's eroded people's trust in media, right? We already know that. But it goes a step further and we, we actually mistrust our own feelings and our own sense of reality because we've heard all this nonsense for so long that it's like, you go, well, was it, is it? You know, you, you have to go through that questioning time and that's where it gets really dangerous. Right, I agree. Well, okay, jaw dropping moment number two. Uh, this actually was on the agenda and um, if I may, the title of our show is, this is a jaw dropper for me, I've done more for the black community than any other president. That's the title of the show. Now, the, the quote is, I've done more for the black community than any other president. Uh, let's take a pass on Abraham Lincoln because he did good, although it's always questionable. Winston, um, <laughs> I go to you on this. Is this for real? I mean, in, in, in the environment of the murder of George Floyd, and the sensitivities of the African community in this country and how raw and tender everyone's nerves are, um, Donald Trump comes out with a statement. Well, you know, in his mind and maybe for his, his, his fans, they believe that. Um, the African-American community does not believe it. I think they look around and they'd say, um, there's no evidence of that. It's like saying he's done more for women or more for the LGBTQ community or for uh, Hispanics or immigrants. I, he, he can say it, but just because you say it doesn't make it true. But like Cynthia was saying, when you say what well, the president said, and we have been conditioned since we were children to have faith and trust in our leaders that what they're telling us hopefully is true or some semblance of the truth. And then you start thinking, well, maybe he has to, uh, uh, maybe, uh, and you don't, and of course you have to look at, you got to search for the real news in this. Well, let's, let's go to history. I mean, I'm not a history major, but I do remember General Grant having to send in federal troops to put down the KKK uh, at re reconstruction period. Um, Truman, President Truman had uh, his hand in desegregating the military. Um, Eisenhower had to bring in uh, troops uh, the National Guard to ensure that segregation of, of schools took place after the Supreme Court decision of um, Brown versus the school board of, I can't remember who. Um, and then you had uh, President Johnson with the Civil Rights Act of 1964. So all these presidents had a hand in, I think, far more and greater things than Donald Trump has done thus far. I, yeah, I, I'm just, like I said, just because he says it does not make it true. Now, there's a lot of people that will say, oh, no, it is true. And they'll point to whatever factors they want to point to. But 
it's one of those jaw dropping moments. And like I said, it, what we'll, we'll remember is from this, I, I don't know, five years from now, we'll still be kind of, um, our heads will be spinning and trying to, to deconstruct what happened. I think you're, I think you're right. There's good, there's many books being written now and there'll be a lot more later. Um, Stephanie, that jaw dropping comment from Donald Trump. Um, what did you find? What did you find hilarious about it? And what did you find tragic about it? Oh, I, I just found it was really scary because I, I think that we're up against a power base here and um, they are in a position that is not scrutinizing anything he says. All of us are, but because we're paying attention and trying to figure it out, uh, because we're not caught up in this power surge that they're feeling with this man representing them. So he is doing representation of people. They're just a different kind of a person. They're people with a different agenda, which they've not had that access to, to voicage and, and, and the uh, exercise of power and got all the rest of us running around like chickens trying to get ready for the election because of their power and their ability to maybe keep this going for them. Is he trying to sabotage any and all hopes that he'll get votes from the, um, the African-American community in this country for his reelection? Because it seems to me that he's going out of his way to crush all possibilities of any kind of support from the African-American community. Good point, Tim, because, you know, I think this also reveals his mental issues is that he thinks by just saying these things and conning people with these, pointing out these it bit things that he thinks can make a point, he thinks that's gonna change people into buying him. He thinks that. He really does believe- So he really only has one audience in his mind and that's his loyal 38 to 44, 45% base. Um, the African, African American community doesn't count when he says these things. Well, he wants them to come over. So he's doing it the way he believes he can influence everyone. Um, that I know everything and saying these things. He's using. I, I need to get uh, my PhD in both psychology and psychiatry to get my arms around that that comment of yours. And I understand what you're saying. I agree. Yes, he in his mind he thinks this is the perfect thing to woo them to my side. He thinks those kinds of things that he does as a con man that he is. He's so talented that way that he will be able to bring some of those people over because he, he doesn't understand how many he needs, you know, but he, he knows he can do it. He has absolute assurance in his skills to convince people to come to him. And uh, I, I don't know that that's going to work this time. It worked in 2016. How many? Yeah, went yeah it did. Um, thank you, Stephanie. S Cynthia, um, other than the reaction of last week that I had that, uh, you know, he, he proclaimed that George Floyd was happy looking down on us and how proud he must be and how happy he is with uh, the, 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 the protests in the streets and all the things that are going to change, uh, even though he was murdered. Um, this one is right up there with that statement. This one is as jaw dropping as I can, I suspect is the case here. What, what was your reaction? I kept echoing in my head every time I would see it on the news or hear it or talk to somebody about it. And all that echoed in my head was him saying, where's my African-American? Oh yeah. I remember that 2016 campaign. I think it was at an airport hangar or an airport tarmac. And he pointed out in the crowd, he goes, there's there my African-American. Yeah, there's my, my African-American. Yeah, possessive form of the word. Yes. Yeah, it was just that to me just echoed in, in the behind every single thing I've heard him say about the Black Lives Matter. I've never heard him say Black Lives Matter. I've never heard him say it once yet, right? He has not uttered those words. And, and I can just imagine he must have been throwing fits in the White House when the mayor wrote Black Lives Matter on the street in front of the White House. He must have, I can't even imagine, he must have had apoplexy on the spot, um, which I think is... <laughs> I think you're right. <laughs> I think you're right about that. Um, all right, well, so does he get a pass from, uh, from African-Americans on that statement? I, haven't, uh, no. I mean, other than a few like Reverend uh, Sharpton and a few other... Um, 
notable uh, commentators. Um, he kind of seems like he's got a pass on that comment. I don't know if he did because I've heard quite a bit of people talking about that as he said it. But the thing that bothers me is that they don't give you any context behind it. They just give you what he said and let you decide for yourself, I guess. So well, that I think a part of his, his, if you were to try to support that statement as an argument, say, well, I passed the prison reform um, bill, but that wasn't something he initiated by no means. And that was, you know, that was definitely a carryover from the Obama administration. A lot of his stuff is carryover from the Obama administration that he takes credit for or he ruins and somehow gets rid of, you know, by executive order or whatever. Um, I think to me, one of the jaw dropping moments for this whole week was when I heard that he had rolled back fishing restrictions in um, waters that have been set aside as sanctuary waters and that's here in Hawaii. So it's something that we deal with up close and personal too. He just rolls back while he's keeping us all, you know, distracted. Distracted. Thing over here. He's behind the scenes rolling back every environmental and almost every environmental restriction that we've worked for years and years, decades to get put in place. And he's just destroyed them. And true, Cynthia, very true. Um, I'm going to switch over to Winston here on this one. We're, we're going to go to, uh, you mentioned an executive order. Well, Donald Trump signed one as of yesterday, and that is the executive order about police reform. Um, you know, this, this executive order seemed to be more of an encouragement and incentive base, which I don't have problems with as far as incentives and getting jurisdictions to think about things to do that they normally wouldn't do through incentives. But in light of where we're at with the, uh, the murder of uh, George Floyd, um, we're not just necessarily looking as a community, as a country, for incentives for police organizations to change. We're looking at, I think, some mandates. And yet the executive order seemed to be incentive based uh, to include um, having a, an incentive base for, for having credentials for all your policemen in your police department to conform probably to a national standard. Um, having co-responders go out with police officers on certain calls, be it domestic violence or, or homelessness, or maybe some uh, indications of mental illness, um, a database that shows a, a, a basically disciplined officers and have a database of, you know, created for, uh, to be shared so they can't be hired from the police department down the road or in a different state. Um, Winston, was, um, what was your reaction to the executive order and, was the items that Donald Trump put in that executive order um, substantial or was it just the first step in a good faith moment? There's an idea. Um, I, I don't think <laughs> that, that just like this gave me some cognitive dissonance in my brain. <laughs> Sorry about that. I would say more that, um, you know, maybe somebody said, look, you just stop talking. 100%. And if you're going to do anything, do this thing that we can, we've can. we already had on the shelf. It's been there forever. Let's just sign it. It's a, a no-brainer. It's not going to be anything that your people will object to, or, and, and we won't even talk about it. Or if we do, it'll be a footnote that says, he's doing something for the community. But we, it, he's voting with his feet. He announced his Juneteenth rally in Tulsa, the site of the, this massacre of the of the black community that speaks it's what's what he does and it's like uh, what stephanie was saying we have to look at the actions and we also have to try and sort through the nonsense and see what's true but let's just take it at face value if this was a, a thing that he did that helps advance um our nation uh with regards to uh, uh racial issues and policing um and and not hiring uh the, the the minority of, of bad cops that are out there um, that from one jurisdiction does, to another. Well, hey Winston, does this give, um, does this give some motivation for the Senate and the house to come together and resolve their differences on the two different bills uh, regarding police, police reform? Does, does his executive order put a little, um, a little hop in their step? 
I don't think so. But when he is aligning with what the Democrats are saying, that's then the Republicans just fall in line. So they're going to come up with something so that everybody can go back home and say, yeah, we're 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 responding to this challenge. But the real work is just beginning because it's just an awareness of that we have militarized um, police forces around the nation to uh, yeah, militarize them. And we need to start thinking in different ways. And this is just the beginning of this conversation that we're having of how do we really invest in our communities um, in, in, a, in a meaningful way so that the police can be back, like I've said, maybe like to Mayberry days. And they're not, if we head off things in the past with prenatal care and education and health care and housing and job training and all of these things to lead to a colorblind society, we're, we're going to eliminate the problem from the beginning. So anything that moves us in that direction is welcome. So let's assume it's a good faith effort by Donald Trump to maybe right. let's give him, let's give him that credit. Let's give him that credit. Uh, Stephanie, I'm going to switch gears here. I, the Supreme court came with a jaw dropping decision that I don't think a lot of us were knew was going to be on the horizon. And that is the employment rights for the LGBT community to have their employment rights uh, completely the same as everybody else's as per the 1964 civil rights, uh, civil rights law. Um, did you catch Don, Donald Trump's comment when that uh, announced, when the, that was announced, that, that Supreme Court decision? Tell me what that was. Well, I'd be happy to. It said, um, here's what he said. Some people were surprised, they've ruled, and we, we live with their decision. That's what it's all about. And we live with the decision of the Supreme Court. I'm not getting one word from this statement that he was appreciative that the Supreme Court did this. Well, I, I think that for me, it is hallelujah. And somebody's acting like the brain that they're supposed to be, because I've not seen much evidence of many of them, particularly the most recent one, that they have this augmented cognitive capacity for the law and they're so brilliant. I haven't seen one iota of it until that. Uh, not, not on the deny, but the person that led it and wrote the positive part of it. So um, I, I'm hopeful that this, that the circumstances then about the Supreme Court are there, we're doing their work in the way we expect it to be done. Um, and uh, which is to be thoughtful and be the, the, the judges that they are and to dig in and fire those legal brain cells they're supposed to have and get with what is the, um, the protocol for this instead of the knee jerk reaction of, um, one of the justices, which was just to send out, you know, how it, it's supposed to all be the same again. But anyway, so I must say that for the the, the one that, that wrote the positive. Uh, I the, think the, that was Judge Gorsuch. Yeah, so I mean, ha yeah, so this doesn't, this give us some reason to have uh, sat at some, what, contentment or harmony. I mean, it, build, it builds trust. All right. Capacity of that institution, maybe it has that one has not been completely hollowed out. Okay, Which great. Thank you, Stephanie. Heartened. Cynthia, um, uh, I'm Tim, sorry. I, go ahead, Winston. On the jump, and I was heartened by this because he just he basically reaffirmed the role of the, the Supreme Court rather than he could have come on and said what his uh, you know his evangelical uh, anti gay base wanted to say, but he didn't because I don't think he doesn't care about gays, lesbians one way or another, honestly. He, I, I really don't think he does. Um, but the fact that he just gave this, oh yeah, this is a ruling and we're gonna abide by it. Uh, that, was, that was nice just to hear that. The other thing that I thought was really interesting was that he said, if he were to lose, he would go on to do other things in the fall. And I thought that was extremely consequential. It was, I read it in the Washington Post. That was the first indication that I heard that he said, I mean, even admitting the possibility that he could lose and then that he would go on to do other things. So I don't know if he's setting himself up for a possible graceful exit. And so maybe these next set, last six months, he's going to say, you know what, let's just do all that we can to kind of bring things together. Because if we look around, we're I, I, I must have missed that last part about him um, talking about 
what if he's not reelected. Um, that would have been jaw-dropping topic number three for me for this week. So I'm glad you brought that up, Winston. Thank you. Um, I just throw it out there because I thought, wow, that is really interesting that he said that. And um, it gave me, you know, uh, yeah, at least he was saying, oh, it was in the uh, Washington Post. I put on on June 12th. So he says he'll go on and do other things if he loses in November. So I don't know. Okay. Thank you for bringing that to our attention. I jaw dropper. Uh, Cynthia, um, the statement uh, that Donald Trump made regarding the Supreme Court decision, um, do you think he was sincere about it or was he playing it as neutral as possible so that his base will still uh, line up with him and the Christian, you know, the evangelicals will still say, all right, uh, he didn't come out for it. He didn't come out against it. Um, we could still stay with him. I think that's why he did it. Exactly. It was because he didn't want to alienate anybody. But um, I, I agree with Winston that I don't think he cares one way or the other, unless it has to do with him being reelected. So I think maybe the reason he's starting to think if I lose, because he might just lose his, um, I think he's put in place a way to cheat. And if we go to mail-in ballots, if we have paper ballots, he's not going to be able to do that and he won't be able to follow through with that. And so I hope everybody out there goes and Googles Ivanka Trump's patents in China. Most of them were for her clothing line and stuff like that, but some of them were for technology. And, the, and there's one <laughs> that is for voting machines, specifically the software that does the tabulations. So <laughs> that alone to me is just such, talk about the red flags you guys were talking about before. That to me is a huge red flag. And I wish we had more media talking about it. I wish they would bring that to the forefront. I wish they would stop talking about everything else and talk only about election security. Because if they don't, we're not gonna have it. And and then well, it just- we know, we know how well he distracts. So it's keeping your eye on the ball, so to speak. Exactly. So that's the thing that worries me the most. And I think that everything that comes out of his mouth right now comes from somebody who wrote it for him. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Yeah, you know, we're almost out of time here. And I want to just get to what I think what you guys think is coming up for next week. Uh, I believe that John Bolton's book um, is going to be flushed out a lot more. We just just before airtime, some of the, the details of his book was coming out. And he's basically indicating that um, Donald Trump's, you know, incompetent, number one, no surprise there, but uh, certainly more corrupted than the impeachment hearings were uh, all about. So um, more about that. And then uh, coming up here in early July, I think, is uh, Donald Trump's niece, um, who's coming out with a book. And I believe the title of the book is um, uh, something about too much and never enough, how my family created the most dangerous man. Um, interesting title. So I think between that book and John Bolton's, uh, John Bolton's book, um, things are going to really light up here and we'll see how it happens. Uh, Winston, you, what do you think? Who, whose kid is that that wrote it? Do you, uh, it's uh, Donald Trump's niece. Who is his sister's daughter? Or? Yeah, his sister's daughter, yes. Judge? Yes, I believe so. I don't know the name. Um, or her name's Mary, excuse me, Mary. Mary Trump. Okay, well... Good. Yeah. Winston, what's your predictions for uh, next week? Uh, I think that he's been laying low a little bit, but after the rally, we're going to see a lot of stuff. And then um, in the buildup to um, uh, the RNC convention in Jacksonville now, but I think uh, right now they're just, their heads are spinning because they've had a lot of stuff that's gone on recently and they're trying to regroup and figure out what's the message going to be going forward. And, um, I don't know. I mean, every week is a new adventure um, in our nation uh, with what goes on. So I have, you just don't know. Stay tuned. All righty. Stephanie, real quick, we're almost out of time. Okay, uh, quickly, uh, but, uh, what, uh, referring back to Winston's comments about what Trump might be, signing, be backing down over these last few months, I want to remind everybody that all the subpoenas went out to the Obama administrative fo folks who are all under indictment. Uh, for whatever it was they were supposed to have done during that administration. So no, he's hot on his agenda. Okay, okay. which is get back stuff. Okay, so watch. For Thank you very much, Stephanie. Cynthia, loud, real quick. 
election security, election security, election security. Okay. You got it. All right, Winston, Stephanie, Cynthia, thank you very much for joining us. It's Trump Week. Again, we'll see you next Wednesday, 11 o'clock, Trump Week. I'm Tim Apicella, your host. Aloha.